The first uh, scripture reading, which we will uh, read in unison, is Psalm 23, a psalm we all know well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Cool. So, have you ever been afraid? Yes. Um... People react differently when they're afraid. Have you noticed that? Ooh, yeah. Like, like sometimes you like you can like literally shake if you're afraid, right? Because you're scared of monsters. So, okay. So, what do you tell yourself? What do you do? Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm going to tell you, uh, we're going to, we're going to talk about that. Something that, that you can do for when you're scared at, at night. So some people, when, when they, they get afraid they they get really, and I think it also depends on the situation too. So it's not always the same time, but some people, when they get afraid, they get really, they get really brave and they think they're going to fight it. Right. So what, what's the stance that we could do for fighting to show fighting? Like this, right? Do you two ever fight? Yeah, right? Okay. I knew that. I have, I have an older sister, and, and we used to fight a lot. But if anybody, if she felt like anybody was threatening me, she would defend me. She would, she would you know, through me. It was like, you've got to get through me to get to her. And I always appreciated that, having my big sister do that for me, right? And then sometimes people, um, when they're afraid, they run which sometimes is a smart thing to do. Okay. So you're, oh, so that's really nice. That's a good story to remember. That's really sweet. Okay. And then sometimes you're afraid and you're like, you don't know what to do. And you're just like frozen. Ever have, ever seen that happen? Where somebody just like you don't know what to do? Um, Harry, Potter. Harry Potter? Yes. I'm not a big you're not a big. That's so funny because I, I have a Harry Potter example in my sermon later. Yeah, and we'll see. Yeah, but you're not a big fan of Harry Potter. Okay. All right. So sometimes you sometimes you freeze because you don't know what to do. Sometimes when people are afraid, they do that. Like they look. Um, you know, like, who... Yes, like she has a wand, right? All right. Well, we see that all the time in Harry Potter where they're defending one another, right? And that's, that was my next example where sometimes you're like, okay, who needs to be taken care of, right? And so... Had no bone and they put the bone back, yeah. How old are you? You're seven. Okay, so I just want you to know, my daughter started reading Harry Potter about your age, and she had to stop. I made her stop because she would have nightmares. And, I, and so we have to, so then I said, you have to go a month without any nightmares, and then I'll let you read again. And she didn't start reading them again until she was 10. <laughs> so you know, Harry Potter just needed to get scarier as they go along. So you might want to say, time out and wait. You've got plenty of time. Yeah, I would hold off. You got the rest of your life to read Harry Potter. And there's all the movies and all that stuff. All right, so number five. You, you didn't like the snake? Oh, my gosh, right? You're only on number three. Okay, all right, so number, the last one is when you get afraid to, when you're afraid to find people to, to, to comfort you. Like, so when I was little and I would have a nightmare at night, I would go into my mommy's room, my parents' room, 
and I would, I remember walking around the bed to my mom's side, right? And then I'd just poke her and I'd say, I had a nightmare. And she wouldn't say a word. She would just lift up the covers and I would crawl in and, and put my back to her. And then she would put her arm around me really, really tight, tightly. And then I would fall asleep. And I'd have a really good me- memory of that, of that, you know, just, and I could just fall asleep because I had her to protect me. So that we, so sometimes I'm afraid we look for people to look for, you know, to, for us. But there are some times in life when, you know, we have to do something on our own and we, and we need to be braver than we're feeling, right? So the Psalm that we just read, this is the Bible, right? And it's, and it's a library of all these different books combined, right? And the, and the Psalms are a book of songs, a book of poems, and it's like almost right in the middle of the Bible. So if you open it up, look. What did it open to? Psalms. Psalms. There's a trick, right? So if, so if anybody says, open your Bible to the Psalms, you'll go, huh, midway, and boom, there we are. Okay. That's so down for you. It's good for me. All right? And the 23rd Psalm is a psalm that is it's something that you could say to yourself. A lot of people, I wonder, let's look around. How many people have memorized the 23rd Psalm in their life? Right? There's a lot of hands going up, right? It's a good one to remind yourself when you're afraid. The Lord is my shepherd. And like, like we're, we're like sheep, and God is like our shepherd who watches out for us. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths. And this, and we're getting to the part where the afraid part. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, even when I'm really scared, I don't need to fear because you're with me. Right? So when one thing that you can do when you're really afraid is to remind yourself, you can say to yourself, even though I walk through a scary, scary place, I know that you're with me. I'm not alone. Right? In the same way that you're holding your, your elephant with you. She's clapping to that? Okay. So sometimes we have to coach ourselves when we're afraid to not, to not be afraid. I need to do this brave thing. And we remind ourselves that God is with us in it. Does that make sense? I totally had them until we got to the God stuff, just so you know. All right. Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Gracious God, thank you for being always with us. Thank you for being our comfort when we're afraid. Remind us, Lord, that we're never alone, that you're always with us, and that you're looking out for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And our second scripture lesson comes from Acts, and we're doing a sermon series through Acts, so we are continuing starting at Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. After they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in the city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy spirit Je- your holy servant Jesus when they had prayed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the holy spirit and spoke the word of god with boldness this is the word of the lord thanks be to god and let us join our hearts in prayer gracious god i pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Tracy Blackman is a UCC, United Church of Christ, pastor. She now works on the national level of the church. But I came to know her. She was a pastor in uh, Missouri and came to be known after the protests that emerged after the killing of Michael Brown 
in 2014. She organized prayer vigils outside of police stations in Missouri and the, you know, everything now has a hashtag, but she started the hashtag praying with our feet. And she came to be known for her prayerful activism. I got to see her in New York City several years ago speak, and she told the story. She was on Capitol Hill with other faith leaders, interfaith uh, representation, going to speak with senators about some kind of legislation, and she always said that for protests and things like that, there are people who are willing to to get arrested, and we we talked about that a few weeks ago, how I was like, oh, Lord, have mercy. Um, that's, that's really challenging. And she said her stance had always been, I'll be there to pay the bail. Okay. I will be the person to, show, to drive the car, to show up, and to pay the bail and get you all out. That will be my role. But she told the story. They were in the Capitol building, and there's this rotunda, and somebody started singing Amazing Grace, and they were all singing... And for some reason, I, I don't know what the rule is, but they were not allowed to sing, and the security guards were telling them to stop. And she said, and my fear was overcome by righteous indignation. She goes, I was mad. I'm going to sing. And she said people came out of their offices to listen and, and sing along, and she was arrested. And she said, you might think that, that the activists, that you know, they're just braver than you. That they're, you know, they, they have a, a different gene, a different you know, a vein that runs in them. She's like, but the truth is, we show up afraid. But we show up. I learned from her. The disciples in Acts have figured out that talking about Jesus, healing in the name of Jesus, is going to bring persecution in fact, it is believed that the writer of Luke and Acts keeps he's writing to a persecuted people because it keeps happening and telling them to be bold, to keep on keeping on despite the reaction that they're going to get. And again, from healing people, from talking about Jesus. And you'll notice that the disciples didn't pray for protection or to make it go away, but they prayed for boldness in the face of threats that they were receiving. Help us to be bold. We see boldness in many characters in Scripture. But, you know, modern day, wouldn't you love it if it said, you know, when David went out with his, you know, his little rock and a slingshot, you know, to, to fight Goliath, that his hands were trembling. That would have humanized him. But I, we can imagine it. But he stepped up regardless. He showed up afraid. There's Esther, who was asked to go, you know, call on the king, and you just don't do that. I think I spoke about that last week. You know, there's, there's a protocol. There's a way to do it. And she was taking her life in her hands by doing it. But if she didn't, what would have happened? There would have been a massacre of her people if she hadn't sp spoken up and knocked on that door and requested to see the king. I, I want to show you a piece of artwork that, that was a gift to my husband years ago. And a friend of my husband's in college who is, who is Jewish went to see this a photographer who has, it's a print that's signed, it's a poster that's signed, and I, it's so powerful, and I had it framed, and then, and then it was like, well, wh where do you hang this? But it, it's, you know, it's one of those images that sticks with you. It's called The, the Last Jews, I mean, I don't know how you pr pronounce it, it's a, um, it's a Polish town, Radauti, and it's one man bearing another. There are some images that are just 
sermons in themselves. There is, I researched it, uh, there's a saying that maybe you've heard. First they came for the socialists, then I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And I th- thought, I wonder who wrote that? It was written by Martin Niemöller, who was a German Lutheran pastor, who was a, a supporter of Hitler's as he came to power, and then when Hitler took power and insisted, insisted on the supremacy of the state over religion, Niemöller was uh, disillusioned, and he became the leader of a group of German clergymen opposed to Hitler. He was arrested and spent the war in two different concentration camps. And he spoke later at a confessing uh, this is part of a speech that he gave at the Confessing Church in Frankfurt in January 1946. He said the people who were put in the camps then were communists. You know, who cared about them? We knew it. It was printed in the newspapers. Who raised their voice? You know, maybe the Confessing Church? We thought communists, those opponents of religion, those enemies of Christianity, should I be my brother's keeper? Then they got rid of the sick and the so-called incurables. I remember a conversation I had with the person who claimed to be a Christian. He said, well, perhaps it's right. These incurably sick people just cost the state money. They're just a burden to themselves and to others. Isn't it best for all concerned if they're taken out of the middle of society? Only then did the church as such take note. Then we started talking until our voices were again silenced in public. Can we say we aren't guilty, responsible? The persecution of the Jews, the way we treated the occupied countries or the things in Greece, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, or in Holland that were written in the newspapers, I believe we confessing church Christians have every reason to say mea culpa, mea culpa. We can talk ourselves out of it with the excuse that it would have cost me my head if I had spoken out. We preferred to keep silent. We are certainly not without guilt. And fault. And I ask myself, and again and again, what would have happened if in the year 1933 or 1934 there must have been a possibility 14,000 Protestant pastors in all Protestant communities in Germany had defended the truth until their deaths? If we had said back then, it is not right when Goring simply puts 100,000 communists in in the concentration camps in order to let them die. I can imagine that perhaps 30 to 40,000 Protestant Christians would have had their heads cut off, but I can also imagine that they would have rescued, and he gives the wrong number, so I'm going to give the right number, that they would have rescued 6 million people because that is what it is costing us now. We are called to boldness, holy boldness. One of the commentators on this passage said that the early Jesus' movement took on, this, uh, took on a rhythm of speech and action and then retreating to be uh, to, for community and sharing and prayer and fellowship. And then they would go out again to action and speech and then retreating again, this rhythm. It is every pastor's dream that, that when we gather for worship, to be, it is to be replenished to then go out to serve with boldness in the world, to then come back and be refreshed that this rhythm is the rhythm of our days, it's the rhythm of our weeks. Because there are times when we are called to be bold, to speak up when we think something is unjust, protest, defend, show up scared, pray for boldness. And it means finding our voice and using it. And... I don't know, as a, as a young person, I have, I have said this um, out loud to other folks, and, and we all need to find that voice. It's part of our call. It's part of being it's a, a follower of Jesus. We all need to find our voice, and some people never do. Maybe for some people it comes naturally, but for a lot of us it takes concerted effort. It takes practice to stand up for what we believe. 
Have you ever been in a situation where you're just waiting for someone to say something? <laughs> and you're looking around, is somebody going to say something? And then finally you realize if you don't say it, nobody's going to say it. I have a vivid memory of that. And then, darn. And the conversation is my, in my head is literally, but I want to be liked. And I don't want to get put in that box. Resist what is inconsistent with your values. And, and here's my Harry Potter example. The, in, in the books of Harry Potter, the, in, in Hogwarts, there are these four houses. I just wanted to, can, if I asked you, would you know what they are? Uh, Gryffindor, Gryffindor, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw, right? And at the end of the year, there's the house cup. And Dumbledore at the end, there's it, of one of these, that gives out points to each of the houses to, you know, who won the prize at the end of the year. Because throughout the year, they're getting points for, for, for behavior, good stuff and bad stuff and all that, right? So it looks like this one house is going to win. And Gryffindor, which, of course, is the Harry Potter's house, right? And they're behind by, it's a dead heat. It's a tie. And then Dumbledore and his, you know, his voice. And there are all kinds of courage, Dumbledore says, smilingly, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to your enemies, but just as much to stand up to your friends. Anybody know who get, any, is anybody with me? Therefore, I award 10 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. Isn't that a great name? Neville Longbottom. Because he stood up to his friends when, they, when he thought they were doing the wrong thing, and they got that point, and they got points, and Gryffindor wins, and oh, we're all happy. I am haunted by a memory of not stepping in when I saw a, a, a kid being bullied. And I was an adult, and I literally just stood there frozen. And this other adult, who come to find out was a teacher and handled it beautifully, she taught me how by watching her, came over and asked the kid, so, you know, where do you need to be? And, do, you know, and all, and, but I, I couldn't believe that at my age I would freeze like a little kid. And I resolved to do better the next time. A friend of mine who's a college teacher lost a sister to an abusive relationship. He saw one of his students, female, had cuts all over her body. And she begged him not to say anything. And he said, never again, no, no, not on my watch. And he reported it, and she got help. Sometimes it's the memory of our failures that spur us on to do the right thing the next time even when we're afraid, and pray for boldness. We have to be willing to step up when our faith demands, when justice is called for and we see something unjust happening. Faith and justice go hand in hand because I, I love the expression that justice is just love out loud. We are called to love God, neighbor, and self. Micah three twenty eight. what does the Lord require but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. In our discernment process, we are discerning, asking God, who would you have us show up for in the community? The, our discernment process assumes that the church will be in ministry somehow to the surrounding community. So that's why we do the demographic study. That's why we did the community interviews. That's why, you know, ear to the ground listening. What are our needs in the community that meet some of our loves and our passions, our gifts, that we can meet those? And then to step out in boldness. One of the things that I... I actually wrote a play about this. Sometimes we can get so consumed with our own stuff... Like we, we think, well, when my, when, if, if everything in our life is perfect, like wait for our lives to be perfect, and then, and that, when is that day? Never. When is that day? And I was with a group of pastors this last week, and I, and I continue to say, when you get by the, hi, how are you? Oh, fine, fine, good, good. And you really ask the question, how are you, and how can I pray for you? Oh my gosh, people are carrying around such heavy stuff. And still, and still we are called, you know, each and every, how can we be of service to God this day and every day? 
this past week I was, um, and as and as you know, I, I uh, have a full plate recently, but I was visiting my, when my mother-in-law was in the hospital and I was sitting with her, her roommate, and I had been praying for this woman because I, the doctor was in and I heard the prognosis. I heard the treatment. I heard her hostility. She didn't trust a soul in that place. And I was praying for her because, oh my goodness. And I was sitting there the next day or the day after that, and uh, she engaged me in conversation. And I ended up talking with her and then praying with her. And I was just so grateful to God that, you know, dis- you know despite everything, that even in even when we are burdened down, you know God can use us. And you know, and, and I want to say, you know, it's not always big ways; it's small ways. But the, and, and I know that for her, I got to shine a little light in her life, but she shined light in me too, because I to, I've told everybody about it, and I'm saying it again now. It was such a you know a blessing to be able to pray with her and to see how well received it was, and and for her to get to share her faith with me, too. Pray for boldness. That when God is asking us to step up, we'll be able to step up afraid. And I, and I do need to say that for me, that journey of being able to, and maybe think that, you know, as a pastor, oh, it must be easy. I have grown into much more bold with my faith, much more for the long, somebody asked me this recently, I don't know who I, you know, in, in, in my home where I live, I've just always, I just want to be Robin. I don't want to be Pastor Robin. I just want, you know, and then finally realizing (laughs) this, my faith is who I, is, is who I am. And so much more free and, 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 and freer with that and bolder with that and get to shine the light and have that light return to me so much more when I'm bold and free wherever I am, recognizing that God places us where we are to shine that light wherever we are regardless. But that's been a journey for me. But as we grow in faith, as we step out, as we meet those fears and recognize how God is with us and sees us through, then we are bolder the next time and bolder the next time and bolder the next time. We can't wait till everything's perfect. God promises to be with us and calls us all the time to shine our lights. With the apostles who were sent out into the world just to witness and testify to what they have seen That is our call this day, every day, to shine our light and not be so worried about the reaction, but to give glory and honor to Jesus Christ, who has made all the difference in our lives so that he might make all the difference in other people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen.